Hello everybody, in this video we're going to be covering section 16.2, Entropy. We're going to start off by defining entropy. We're going to explain the relationship between entropy and the number of microstates. And we're going to learn how to predict the sign of the entropy change for chemical and physical processes. So we've been talking a bit about reversible processes and now we're going to dive into this a little bit more. So everything that we've said about reversible processes, reversible reactions is true thus far. But in order to be a truly reversible process, it actually basically has to qual uh, reach some criteria that doesn't really exist for any real processes. It's really more of a conceptual thing than anything else. Um, that means that even though it isn't truly reversible, there's a lot of reactions and a lot of processes that we can treat as being reversible. Um, and basically what it is is a reversible process. It's going to basically be a process that can be broken down into nearly infinite steps. And each one of those steps um, can be changed in reverse, so the direction of each step can be reversed by changing some small condition just infinitesimally. So just a very, very small change. It's a bunch of different steps and each one's just on the tipping point as to whether or not it goes to the previous step or the next step, basically. That means that we would have like a near spectrum of reversibility so that any any point during this process we could just start going back the other way and we would have to have almost no change in the conditions in order for that to happen. Um, so it's really more of a formalism that we use to develop a lot of techniques and ideas in thermodynamics. In 1824, there was a guy by the name of Carnot, and he published the results of an extensive study regarding the efficiency of steam engines. He wanted to figure out how we could make steam engines more efficient, and he came up with something called the Carnot cycle that you may study if you continue on in chemistry or engineering. Um, that basically said that the efficiency of the engine is going to be dependent upon how hot one part of the engine gets and how cold the outside part of the engine gets. That the maximum efficiency is going to be capturing all of the heat transferred, uh, transferred when that engine is running. And then uh, along came a guy who starts looking at Carnot's work. His name is Rudolf Clausius. And he introduced a new thermodynamic property that relates the spontaneous heat flow accompanying a process to the temperature at which the process takes place. And what Clausius named his new property was called entropy. And he defined it like this, where we have the heat that was done reversibly during the process divided by the temperature that that uh, system is at and that is going to be the change in, in entropy. Um, this is similar to other thermodynamic properties uh, This in that it is a state function. This means that it doesn't matter where what the path it takes is, okay? Uh, delta S uh, is only going to depend on the initial state of the system and the final state of the system, okay? So even if the system goes through many different paths to get to that first state and that final state, um, its change in entropy is going to remain the same. So as I've alluded to, entropy is related to this idea of dispersing out matter and energy and keeping it uniform. Um, and a guy by the name of Ludwig Boltzmann uh, he developed a statistical model to kind of put some math to that. Um, and it relates the entropy of the system to the number of microstates. All right, so a microstate is a state that a system could find itself in. All right, and uh, it's a specific configuration of all the locations and energies of the atoms or molecules that make up the system. So more than one microstate could wind up being a specific state that we've talked about thus far, right? Uh, for instance, when we were talking about gases, 
we said that a state had a specific pressure, volume, temperature. There are m numerous different microstates that will give you that same pressure, volume, and temperature. Um, the relation between a system's entropy and the number of possible microstates is given by this, where we have entropy is equal to the Boltzmann constant, which is this value right here, times the natural log of the uh, no, uh, number of microstates. Uh, so once we have a definition for what the entropy of the system is at a given state, we can start talking about the difference and between different states. So if I have, again, always the final minus the initial. So if I know the entropy of the final system, I knew the entropy of the initial system, I could subtract those. We're going to be able to see that we make a substitution here for that. And then if we apply our log rules, we'll get that that is equal to the Boltzmann constant times the natural log of the, where we have the microstates of the final um, the final system divided by the microstates in the initial system. Once again, the change in entropy does not depend on the path. So you can see that when we look at this math here, we only have information about the final system and the initial system. We don't have any information about any of the systems or microstates that existed in between these two states. Um, and again, that is not just a property of entropy. All thermodynamic state functions operate this way. So delta H works this way that we've learned about in enthalpy. And we're going to learn about a new one in uh, the next couple of chapters that also works this way. And that's a really powerful statement in a lot of ways, right? We, we now have a way where we only need to make two measurements. We only need to know, have information about the initial and the final system. And then we can start to calculate all of these values and then learn things about spontaneity and the energy that's going to be released and stuff. We don't really matter what happens in between. All right. So an increase in the number of microstates, where we have WF greater than WI, yields an increase in the entropy. We're going to have delta S being greater than zero. A reduction in the number of microstates yields a decrease in the system entropy. Microstates with equivalent particle arrangements, not considering individual identities. So this is an important idea here. If you've ever uh, taken statistics or anything and you've seen like uh, uh, computations versus uh, other ordered systems, if we do not pay attention to which particles and which thing, just whether or not a particle exists in a spot, all right, are grouped together and are called distributions, right? This whole idea is something that you'll learn about if you really get into this later called degeneracy. There's a degeneracy of microstates, microstates that exist but are uh, completely similar as far as their energy to other microstates. The most probable distribution is the one with the greatest entropy. So let's take a look at this example and see if we can make the idea of microstates a little bit less confusing. Okay, so here I have a system where I have two boxes, right, and I have four particles. Now I've colored these so that you can tell which particle is which, right, and that is so that we can visualize that there are four different scenarios, for instance, where one of the particles leaves this box and goes to the other box, right? Similarly, there's one, two, three, four, five, six scenarios where there's an even distribution and two particles in each box. And then we're going to have four uh, here where we have the one particle in this box. And then there's just one state down here where the particles are all on the right hand side, just like there was up here. So we can see that there are more, that the more evenly distributed they are, right, or the case where we have two particles on either side, the more microstates there are that represent that, okay? Now, if we wanted to know the probability 
what we would need to do is first know the total number number of microstates that we have right so we've got five eight uh, 11, 14, 15, 16 microstates altogether. So the probability, for instance, of having one particle in one side of the box, uh, the, in the right hand box, would be the 1, 2, 3, 4 divided by the total number of microstates, 16, right, or 1 fourth, 25% probability of having this configuration, right? Now, if we wanted to know the probability of having one particle in either of the boxes, whether it be the left-hand box or the right-hand box, well, then we would go 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 8 divided by 16. So we have a 50% chance of having that condition met. All right. Um, and so going through this, we can draw two big conclusions here. Number one, we have a greater probability of being in a situation where uh, everything is evenly distributed, and that is because that has the largest number of microstates. Now, when we're dealing with something other than that really simple system, uh, we do it does scale up quite fast. Okay, so for instance, adding more particles in the previous system would result in an exponential increase in microstates, where we're going to have 2 to the n, where n is the total uh, number of particles. All right, and so 2 to the n is going to get real big real fast. All right, uh, if we had even one mole of particles, we would have n equals 10 to the, roughly 10 to the 23. So we'd have 2 to the 10 to the 23rd power. And that would just be a huge number of microstates, right? So we can't continue to always model things this way. We have to use other better statistical techniques. But regardless of the number of particles in the system, the distributions in which roughly equal number of particles are found in each box are always going to be the most probable configuration. All right, so we're always going to see this equal distribution in this same pattern arise. Okay, and not only that, as you have more and more particles, a single particle moving from one box to the other just starts to have less of an effect. So we get like a whole distribution where the ma vast majority of the microstates is going to be centered around a fairly even distribution. We can apply the same sort of idea to heat as a microstate. Um, so if we consider uh, a system consisting of two objects, each containing two particles and two units of thermal energy, so I have two boxes here, there are two particles, and initially all the thermal energy is just on A. I can have all of these different microstates as to where that thermal energy winds up going. Okay. Um, initially, this would be like the hot object, right? But in the end, what winds up happening is the most number of microstates involves having those heat little particles there, the little thermal energy units, being distributed evenly on either side of the two boxes. Right? So again, the most probable configuration is for everything to uh, spread out. All right? And it's less likely that it's going to be localized in any one spot. And again, if we started to scale this up, we would see that this distribution would start to favor even more so having a very uh, distributed system in it. Okay, so let's see if there's anything that we can do to predict the sign of delta S for a specific process. And the first thing we're going to talk about is going to be phase changes. So it might not surprise you to think that a solid, right, where we know that the atoms are restricted to nearly fixed positions, um, is going to have a relatively small number of microstates. There's not a lot of movement that can happen to create new microstates in a situation like that. 
This means that the entropy of a solid phase is going to be relatively small. In the liquid phase, the atoms and molecules are now being able to freely move around. They can take on more and more microstates, but they are still restricted in that they have to stay in close proximity to one another. This means that the number of microstates is greater than for solids. So the entropy of a liquid is going to be greater than the entropy of a solid. Um, this means that if we start thinking about processes where we move between solids and liquids, we can start to predict the sign of delta S. All right. For instance, melting, where we're moving from low entropy solids to higher entropy liquids, we're going to have an increase in the uh, entropy for that system. And freezing, the reverse of that, we're going to have a decrease in the entropy for that system. Um, atoms or molecules in the gas phase occupy a much greater volume than in the liquid phase. This leads to a really explosive uh, increase in the number of possible microstates for these gas systems. Each atom or molecule can be found in many more locations, and this is going to uh, result in a general uh, statement that goes like this, where the entropy of gases is going to be greater than the entropy of liquids, which is greater than the entropy of solids. Uh, and again, if we start to consider uh, these various transitions that we can have, um, for instance, vaporization or sublimation, where we're going from a liquid to a gas or a solid to a gas, is going to have an increase in uh, entropy. Condensation and deposition, where we're going from a gas to a liquid or a gas to a solid, is going to result in a decrease in entropy. And I think that's all summed up pretty nicely with this imagery right here. As we move from a crystal and solid to a gas, we have increasing entropy and we can predict the sign of each one of these different transitions. So let's talk about entropy and temperature. We know that they're going to be related because um, we saw temperature in the definition of entropy. Um, and so let's think about what effect that's really going to have. The temperature of a substance is proportional to the average kinetic energy of its particles. We know that this is true right that when uh, we increase the temperature what we're really doing if we hold the mass of the particles constant is we're causing those particles to start to move faster all right this means that solids are going to have more extensive vibrations and liquid and gases are going to have more rapid translation of particles where translation is them actually literally moving and translating around at higher temperatures, the distribution of kinetic energies among the atoms or molecules of the substance is also broader than at lower temperatures. And we talked about this a little bit when we were doing thermochemistry, um, that we actually start to see a broadening in the distribution of the kinetic energies. All right. At low temperatures, they're going to be fairly tight, meaning that all the molecules are going to have similar kinetic energies. And as the temperature rises, we're going to start to see more and more molecules that have much higher kinetic energies and some that have much lower kinetic energies. We're just going to see a wider distribution. And for this reason that we're increasing this kinetic energy distribution, so we're increasing the distribution of energy, the entropy for any substance increases with temperature. And we can kind of uh, view that right here. So at a lower temperature here we had a nice tight distribution of kinetic energies right most of our uh, atoms our molecules are falling within a relatively narrow range at a higher temperature we're starting to see a wider and wider distribution this is actually called the Boltzmann distribution the same guy who did uh, the work on this uh, came up with this distribution and we see that now there is a much wider range of kinetic energies to encompass the same number of molecules. So uh, we've increased the entropy. Also, as we increase the temperature, we tend to get those phase transitions we were just talking about, thereby increasing the entropy of the system uh, if we have crossed a boundary where we actually had a phase transition.